First, let me say a huge thank you to Synology for sending me this network drive to review. In front of me, I have the Synology DS920 Plus. And yes, it's in the name of the video. It isn't just a regular network storage device. Well, actually the correct term would be a NAS, a network attached storage. In this video today, we'll have a closer look at the DS920 Plus, what the specifications are, what comes inside the box, installing an SSD and HDD, and finally configuring the unit itself. Over the years, Synology has spent a lot of time developing the DSM software. This opens you up to a wide range of applications that you can use on your NAS. And just to name a few, these would be such as Active Backup, Docker, Synology Moments, Surveillance Station, VPN Server, Plex, and lots, lots more. We will take a look at the DSM shortly, so stick around to see what's included. I will be diving deeper into some of these applications that come with the DSM in another video. So hit the subscribe button if you wanna have a look at what those applications are. At the time of this recording, the price of the unit is $533.99 on Amazon. My Amazon affiliate links are in the description below if you wanna have a look at them. This seems pretty pricey compared to some of Synology's entry-level drives, but this gives you a little bit more. It comes with four hot swappable drives on the front. It has a four core two gigahertz CPU, which can burst up to 2.7 gigahertz. It uses something called cache acceleration, which will need two M2 MVMV SSD drives. And it allows you to scale out in the future by purchasing the additional DX517 expansion unit. So that turns the four drives that come included into here and you can add an additional nine. Anyway, enough of me talking about this unit. Let's take a look at what comes inside the box. So if we take a look at the drives first that we're gonna be installing today. So here is a 400 gig HDD. Um, this is a Seagate drive, it's four terabytes. So we're gonna be installing two of these. And along with this, we're gonna be installing an M2 solid state drive. This is a 400 gig drive. So let's quickly go inside the box, quickly open this up. This is what comes inside. So you have the unit itself, you have some accessories in here and some other bits in here. So we'll have a quick look in a second. Just to let you know, I have done a review on a DS1621. So if you wanna have a look at those, you can feel free to click on the link on the screen and there's a review to that as well. So let's quickly open this. There we go, that's the unit itself. So this definitely is a lot lighter than the other unit, the, the DS1621, uh, sorry. So we have a USB 3.0 at the front. We have the power. You have some LED lights along here. These are the drive bays, which we'll have a look at in a second. At the back, or at the bottom, should I say, you have the M2 SSD install. So it shows you how to install and remove. So we'll have a look at that as well. Um, you have some fans at the back. Uh, these are the two one gigabit network ports, an eSATA port. DC in and another USB and you have a Kensington lock mount here as well. Let's just pop that aside to a second. Let's have a look at what comes inside these also. Uh, power unit, so we do need to power it up. And inside here I'd imagine is the rest of the bit. So quick start guide, um, power. So it comes with a power bank, two network cables. Um, we have a third network cable. Okay, interesting. And is there anything on this side? Yep, yeah, we have a fourth network cable. So I'm guessing these uh, packagings are fairly generic because this only has two network ports on it, but it comes with four, uh, Ethernet, uh, four Ethernet cables. We have the keys. I'll show you what that does in a second. And we have some screws to screw the drives in if we need to. So let's pop these two aside. So I'll quickly show you what the keys do first can just lock the drive here. So this basically stops the drive from opening so you're not able to do so. Normally you can pull out and the drive will bay will come out. However, if you lock it, it doesn't come out at all. Just a bit of extra added security for you if you don't want your drives being taken or if there is something, um, you can actually just lock these bays themselves. Let's quickly move on to the uh, hard drive install. So you can take out these side panels here. 
There we go. So they just pop out just there, just push inside there and one of those will pop out. Okay. We can grab the drive, pop the drive in facing down. There we go. And you can pop these back in. There we go. So that's gone in and it stops the drive coming out. So the drive doesn't come out anymore. So that's now locked into place. So let's pop one of those in. And that just goes straight in and clips in. There we go. And we'll do the same with the second one. And we'll just lock these up to keep them safe. And there we go. There's the two discs installed. Now, moving on to the NVMe drive, you can see there's two slots at the back here. Oh, I went flying. So you have number one and number two. So to install this part is quite simple. We just pop this in just here and we pull this tab back and there we go. You can hear it clicking. And that's it. It's really simple to install these drives. So we'll quickly install the second one as well. And there we go. Then we just replace the cover back on here. So pop these in, close that and pop this one in and close that. So I'll tell you what we do now. We've got everything installed. We've gone over everything on the unit. So let's go ahead and get it powered up and let's jump on to the computer and have a quick look at it. So once this is all plugged in and powered up, I've got two network cables set up and plugged in and we just need to go to find.synology.com. What that will then do is search your network to find uh, the Synology drive that's on there and you will then go through the setup. If in the case that you can't find it or it does not locate it, make sure you are on the same subnet to make sure that it can search it. So there we go, without delay, it's found it already, it's given you the version, the model number, it finds the second one because I've got two network cables installed, um, so 178 and 175 are the two IP addresses, so we're just going to click connect, so let's go ahead and connect to this one, you agree to the EULA, uh, continue, just going to zoom in slightly to hopefully that will help you see it, so we're then we're going to set up the device. We're going to install the DSM um, with all the latest features, so let that go off and install. And all the data will be erased on drive 1 and 2, which is fine, it's no problem. Uh, these are blank drives, so there's no issue with that. And we will then let that go off and do what it needs to do. Once that bit is set up, you can go ahead and give it a server name. So I'm going to actually call this home. The username, I'm going to be admin. Sorry, it won't let you actually select admin. So let's just call it inside wire uh, password. There we go. So that's set up. Yes, it is a weak password. It's just something I'm showing for demonstration purposes, but make sure you do select a complex password to get into this. So let's click next. Uh, we're just going to skip this step for now, but if you want a remote uh, quick connect uh, via the Synology DS920 without port forwarding so you can access it through the cloud, you can actually create an account or sign in here. But I'm going to skip this step for now. So there we go. That's it. We're all, we're all set to go. So this is the main DSM. So this was the software I was talking about earlier. It's just going through some tips. So the first thing you want to have a look at is actually the storage manager. So if we jump into here. You can see there's no volumes or storage pools available. So let's start off by creating the volume. Um, we want to click custom. Now, unfortunately, we only have two drives in here. So our RAID options are going to be very limited, but we can create a new storage pool. We want higher flexibility. So we want to use SHR. So we want to give this a description. It's optional. So again, I'm just going to call this home. Click next and you select the two drives you want to add into there. So the more drives you have, the more you can add into here. So we click next. Okay, we just click continue and then it's going to erase the drive again. It's going to perform a drive check. We can allow it to go off and do that. We click next. We want BTRFS because it gives us more um, flexibility and more options. So we want to add those in. We click next. And there we go. So it's telling me I've got 3721. So likely this is going to be a mirrored drive setup, which is basically One's going to be your main drive and the other one's going to be a backup. So if one fails, you can pull that one out and then plug the other and replace it and plug it back in and it will rebuild the RAID. So we click next and there we go. That is all set up and it's going off and creating that. So we'll leave that for a few minutes and let that go off and create. While that's going off and creating, let's have a quick look at the HD and SSD. So these are the drives that we installed that I mentioned earlier. So we have the two Seagate drives, the four terabyte drives that I mentioned earlier, and we have the two NVMe cache devices. Now, unfortunately for the cache devices, they can't actually be set up. 
to maximize the use of the N2 drives. So unfortunately, you can only use these as cache settings as we'll have a look at shortly. So the SSD cache in here, you would click create. So you can choose a mode within the SSD cache creation. You've got read write cache or you've got read only cache. So we're gonna choose read write for now. We click next and we're gonna use both devices as well to read and write uh, for the cache. We're gonna choose a RAID 1 option. And what RAID 1 gives you is mirroring. So we click next. Um, maximum size, again, remember it uses both drives. So uh, drive one, drive two, so whatever the sizes are, that's its equivalent to one. So 372 gig, we click apply, understand, and we click OK. So that's just gonna go off and set that up. And then again, that will be loading itself in the background doing all the right bits that it needs to do. So we can close that. I wanna show you uh, the network settings. So one thing I did mention earlier is these have two one gig ethernet ports. So what you can do is create a bond which allows you to have a dynamic link aggregation, which means both of them will work simultaneously. So we click, uh, we choose dynamic aggregation here. We click next, we choose the two ports that we want. We choose the IP configuration and we click apply. Now, it's not just a case of doing that just here. Unfortunately, there is some more configuration to be done on the switch side. So we're gonna click yes there and let that go ahead. Um, I have a unified network here with a 24 port switch. So I know for a fact that they are plugged into port four and five, uh, five and six, sorry. So just gonna click here, change the, uh, change the profile override from switching to aggregate and we wanna aggregate ports five and ports six, and we'll click apply. So that's gonna go off and change the configuration there, and in the meantime, this will also apply the network settings at the same time. So what should happen is we'll come back to uh, 10.1.1.178, and we should be connected on the bonded interface. And there we go, we're connected back up again. So if I go to the interface, you can see we have bond one, so the two NICs have disappeared. Um, and we have one connected here and the network status is 2000 megabits per second. Now, slight caveat there, it doesn't mean your full throughput is gonna be 2000 megabits per second. Uh, what it basically means is you have two one gigs. So if you're sending traffic through, your, your maximum throughput will still be 1000 gig, thousand megs, sorry, but you can use two interfaces so they can work simultaneously. Now, there are plenty of configuration settings on here that you can play around with. Um, I could do an hour, two hours, even three hour video on all the different settings you can configure on here. I have gone into a little bit more detail in another video where I look at the 1621XS. So if you wanna have a little look at that, the link to the video is in the description below. For now, let's have a quick look at the package center because I said we would have a quick look at it here and see what's available. Now, like I said, there's a vast range of applications you can use in here that suit all different environments, whether you're a business, home user, um, even to a point some enterprise applications are, are, are good on here. There's three different areas. You've got installed, all packages and beta packages. So anything here is what you've already got installed. So this is all installed automatically. And these are all the packages that are available. Now, again, I'm not gonna run through them all one by one, but it gives you a sort of idea. So we were talking about active backup earlier. So this even does Microsoft 365 as well. We have audio stations. You can run a DNS server off here, document viewer, uh, all your backup facilities. So you can back up your Windows machines and also you can set up your time machine to this as well. You can set up a separate volume for you to back up your Mac to. Uh, you can use this as an LDAP server, media server, uh, moments. So you can actually use, um, store all your photos on here and you can actually use an app to access them through your uh, tablet. Radius server, proxy server, replication services, surveillance station. So surveillance station is one I'm probably gonna deep dive into a video on. So if you wanna see that, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And then you've got things like virtual machine manager, VPN, web station. So these are all interesting ones as well. And then you've got a load of third party applications. So they're the ones that have been developed by Synology. These are all third party applications. So you've got Apache, Docker, uh, GitLab, iDrive, uh, MariaDB, PHP, Perl. Um, another one that I'm probably gonna be looking at is the Plex Media Server. So we'll have a look, little look at that and how that works. Uh, WordPress, Tomcat, so there's quite a few in here. Now, if you wanna have a little look at some of the beta packages as well, they are in here, which there isn't really too much at the moment, but they've got Active Backup for Business, Synology Drive Server, and Synology Office. So this allows you to do your collaboration between um, some of your documents. So Synology released this drive last year. 
Is it still worth buying? For me, yes it is. However, if there was one feature I could upgrade in this, I would put in a 10 gigabit network card. However, as I mentioned earlier, you can use the link aggregation to allow you to have two one gig links. The drive itself can be used in multiple scenarios for small, medium businesses, if you're using file or data sharing, or even collaboration work. Or if you're like me at home, it's packed with features from automatic backup, media streaming, running virtual machines, Docker, and lots, lots more. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below if you would still buy one of these. All the links to the products I have used are in the description below, so feel free to check them out. This is Inside Wire, and I'll see you in the next one.